Good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe. Good evening, Asia and China. My name is Rob Straw. I'm the CEO of SEEPS Zurich Campus uh, based in Switzerland. I have the honor to welcome you today to our third webinar in our Future of Work series. The series consists of five webinars on key topics like uh, relating to the future of work, such as diversity, culture, talent management, leadership, strategic business models, as well as the organization of the future. All of this is linked to technology and recently how the COVID-19 has been influencing the workplace landscape globally. So we look to North America, we look to Europe, we look to Asia. We also look how the future of work affects individuals, teams, firms, industries, and even nations as we go forward. We're very thankful that uh, to work with the firm Swiss Re, with Earlycon, I4CP, which is today, Boyden and Mercer, as well as our SEEPS professors to bring you, bring you a diverse and current thought leadership from around the world. SEEPS, who is SEEPS? I'd like to share a slide with you about who SEEPS is. Who is SEEPS? SEEPS is a leading uh, business school based in Shanghai, China. Uh, if we look on the left side with rankings and accreditations, uh, we were the first school to have Equus and AAC accreditations years ago. Our Gimba program last Monday was ranked number two globally by the Financial Times after being ranked five, number five for the last two years. Our MBA, our MBA program, full-time MBA program was ranked number five for the last two years. Uh, we're, we're a business school that focuses only on business education. We have MBA programs, we have executive MBAs, global MBAs, finance MBAs, hospitality MBA, and I'll come to that in a second, as well as a plethora of executive education programs that we run around the world. Something specific about our, our particular school is that we have five global campuses. We have three in China, in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Beijing, as well as in Accra, Ghana, and in, and in, in Switzerland, we have the campus for Europe in, in, uh, in Zurich. We have around 70 full-time faculty around, representing 20 different countries. And we're very proud that our, our network, our bench of, uh, is, of alumni is over 26,000 strong and across uh, 85 countries. Today's webinar is on the organization of the future. How does, how is the organization going to change with the future of work? Uh, today's discussion is in partnership with the Institute for Corporate Productivity. It's a leading research firm focusing on discovering uh, people practices that drive high performance. During the, uh, the, the webinar today, I encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get through some of them at the end of, of the presentations, both from Professor Shin and from Kevin. It's my a great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. First of all, I introduce Catherine Shin. She's a professor of management at SEEPS. She's the buyer chair in leadership. She's the associate dean for Europe. She's the co-director of our hospitality MBA, as well as the director of our service excellence and leadership learning lab at SEEPS. She, spe she specializes in the area of leadership, organizational culture, change management, as well as strategic human resource management because the soft things are the hard things. Kevin Martin, Kevin, uh, Kevin is the Chief Research Officer based in Boston at I4CP. He advises corporate as well as human resources uh, leadership teams on best and next practices on a, on a broad range of topics from talent risk management and corporate culture to human capital strategy to organizational agility. He also serves as an executive sponsor of I4CP's distinguished Chief HR uh, Officer Board, which reach, meets regularly. Catherine, I give the word to you. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing what you have to, to say. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I would like to share some thoughts um, about the future of the organization. Let me share the screen right here. The future of organization, the current work we are in 
uh, is characterized by uncertainty, uh, complexity, volatility, ambiguity. And uh, this is actually creates what the world we may call it chaos. And part of this uncertainty and ambiguity is driven by technology. We're living in the digital intelligence era. And the, the digital intelligence in the past 10 years has made tremendous changes as well. If we look at the scenarios, the application scenario of the, of the digital technology, it shifted from consumer internet to industrial internet. Consumer internet, as you can see from the left side, is really from what we live on, you know, things we live, lives, clothing, food, housing, transportation, entertainment, and consumer internet, and that drives industrial internet, you know, that design, manufacturing, logistics, and we are thinking of, about connectivity, decision-making, human robot collaboration, and all of that. These leads to our thinking into the future of our organizations. But before we get into that, let's take a look at the challenges in this digital intelligence time. Here is a simple example. AI significantly improved productivity. JD's sorting center in Dongguan in Guangdong province used to employ more than 3000 employees. Now there are only 20 people left with the, you know, the the drop of the cost by 86% thanks to more than 300 sorting robots that work day and night and never complain. I will share with you a very short video. Artificial intelligence significantly improves the productivity. It also improves the service efficiency and service quality. Look at the data we got here from Alibaba. Smart custom service, you know, robots, artificial intelligence is taking up 94% of the service work. And not the productive, only the productivity, but the 3% higher in customer satisfaction compared to human service support. And let's look at this number. With every second, artificial intelligence can, automat can automatically automate it, graphic design, 8,000 posters. And the facial recognition accuracy is 99.99% much higher than human eyes. All these have significant implications for our organizations in the future. Let's look at this phenomena. Who are we working for? Amazon's Mechanical Turk assigns complicated and orderly data to human engineers for sorting. 
and the mechanic Turk would check the work and send the paychecks to software engineers around the world. So in the future, who are our employer employers? So the future of the organization is coming and is becoming very intriguing, interesting, and also uncertain and, in, and challenging. When we think about the organization of the future, one of the core drivers we're looking at is customer as asset. As Thomas Peter says, treat customer as an appreci appreciating asset. Ali, Alibaba is very well known and uh, the mobile payment system on its platform, Alipay is also very well known. Payment, completion of payment that is only the the checkout of the payment part is basically the beginning of digital operation start. After the payment, all the marketing operations and the digital finances, customer relationship management, supply chain management, financial solutions, many different products and platform transactions, uh, logistics, just get started. We can also look at the co-creation processes. LKK Design is the world's largest industrial and design company created in China. It has 1,000 industrial designers. It's the biggest one. In the old business model, if they would like to grow, the only way they do it is through adding more designers, adding more projects. And the founder, Jiawei, decided to use the digital intelligence, created the platform. So now they are having super individuals, collective intelligence, self-organization, and a multilateral network. Let me explain a little bit about what it means. Basically, the design work is done with a heavy and a deep involvement of users. That's what we call the designers and the end users are working together. We call them super individuals. The new business and the new business supply chain, the self-organization starts through one example I like to share. They just finished the design of the first electric car, the real one. And this project involved 2.25,000 customers, engineers, designers, suppliers, and people in the ecosystem or entities. So in the end, what it has is a self-organized system because since suppliers, end users, and the auto parts producers all involved in this whole processes and they know what they need to do. So that is a new business and a new business supply and the organization right there. What we look at relationships, connections is collective intelligence and multilateral network. So if, if thinking, imagine if we are an organization, how are we going to manage this system? When we look at the value creation processes, we also look at the role coordination. We are probably very familiar with this uh, dependence, the symbol that is one of the best known in the world from Michelin. And the, the company, it, it takes Michelin 10 years to transform a traditional production line which is long and with many steps involved with very different roles, many different layers into a self-managed empowering organization. Basically, there are two layers and the, the, all the blue collar workers take up the responsibility of many of the frontline management job. They cut out completely the mid-level. So they become a self-organized, multi-roles and fast-changing organization. And they started with 
an experiment in Ireland 10 years ago, and now it's implemented around the world in all its manufacturing facilities. And so when we're looking at all this, we have to look, ask some questions and challenges and it leads to a lot of thoughts and reflections. Some of the core paradox that drives us to think about is, well, rational versus emotional. Should we compete or should we cooperate when we think about the ecosystem? Should we trust the contracts or human trust, which can significantly reduce transaction costs? Should we look at artificial intelligence for efficiency, effectiveness, and higher satisfaction or humanity and human touch? Should we emphasize more on customer-centric organization or should we emphasize more on employee-centric organization? These are the questions we need to think hard and we may not have answers, but we are really in the world of the paradox. Just share with everyone here an experiment and also a research study we conducted um, with colleagues. Um, you look at artificial intelligence involvement in recruitment for people or had a job offer if they are interviewed by you know, robots versus interviewed by human interviewers. The perceived fairness is very, very different. As you can see right here, and they perceive it a lot fairer by human beings. But actually, if we think rationally, artificial intelligence probably are more objective. They are not biased by our gender, our ethnicity, our educational background, our looks or our age or anything, right? But people feel that that's, that's, we are only human, they feel the human touch make them feel they are treated more fairly. So whether you like it or not, the future of organization is here. So whether we are ready or not, we have to embrace organization of the future. Thank you. Catherine, thanks so much. I particularly like this slide about the paradox. I'm sure in the Q&A in a little bit, we're gonna come back to that. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to just pass it right on to you, Kevin, and let you present, and then we'll address some questions and get into a dialogue after you're finished. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Robert. And uh, Catherine, that was awesome. I was taking lots of notes while you were sharing what you were. Um, you know, folks, I, I, I would like to just start out by uh, sharing, I think it's, a, it's almost our master of the obvious moment, but you know, in this world of continuous disruption that we're in, and it's going to remain, right? There's, uh, with all the change that's happening all around us, from our vantage point, the, the goal has changed from being able to manage change, which is very reactive and just the way it's done, to the ability to manage amid change and, and creating the muscle. And from our vantage point, two things are gonna remain constant when you think about the organization today and the organization of the future, but everything around it is augmented. The two things that are, that are gonna remain constant that are absolutely critical are culture and capability. And, but what, you know, when you take a look at what Catherine was talking about with advanced work automation, like AI and natural language processing, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, and other factors, things change capability changes. Culture is going to take on a, a, a new route within an organization because that culture needs to be monitored and morphed as the business changes. In fact, what our research has shown for at least 15 years is that high performance organizations, those that have the best market share, customer satisfaction, revenue growth over the last few years, they have mastered the interdependency of five core variables when it comes to, let's say, the people, the capability, the culture side of the business. And what we're talking about here is 
um, it is a series of questions that we know that the organizations that have really mastered the relationship of these interdependencies, this has allowed them to better anticipate, adapt, and act on the change that constantly happens. In fact, it allows them to change themselves at a speed that keeps them pace, if not ahead, of the changing marketplace or their customer needs or their competition. And basically, the, the five-factor formula is anytime there's a shift in the market, and we've had some significant shifts to the market when you think about just the the COVID-19 pandemic in and of itself, let alone so many other factors. That ipso facto dictates a shift in business strategy. And our research shows that leading organizations, at least on a quarterly basis, are regrouping and suggesting how is, how is what's going on right now affecting what the strategy is we're laying out? What do we need to adapt in order to yeah, from a strategic standpoint, in order to achieve the objectives that we've laid out as a business? And the important variable is anytime that there's a shift in strategy, leading companies know that they've got to start looking internally and saying how and whether that affects and where that affects their culture and where their culture is actually supporting the strategy or not. And there are all types of leadership implications that follow with that. Um, and of course, tremendous talent derivatives. And this is where the leader and talent capability factors in. And when it comes to the capability side, there are several questions that uh, high performance organizations are constantly looking at. And this is where I'm gonna take some of what, what, uh, what I'd like to posit to this audience today. And Robert and Catherine, it really builds off last week's webinar. Um, that you all put on around talent ecosystems as well. But, you know, thinking about, do we have the talent that's going to let us win in the future? Do the pockets of talent, do the pools of talent that we pull from now, are they going to be relevant for us going forward? If they are relevant, or excuse me, if they're not relevant, where do we find the talent we're going to need? Our own research that we've done, and we did an extensive study uh, with Professor John Bedreau at the University of Southern California last year on AI, advanced work automation, and the future of work. And that research clearly showed from the business executives, we had 1,700 business executives around the world that took part in that study, that they, the vast majority of them believe that advanced work automation is not going to replace workers. That video that Catherine showed is fantastic. And, and in many manufacturing facilities, we see that happening. But in, in across the board, across industry, what we're seeing much more is the augmentation of work, um, where machine and person are working together and it changes. The work is being changed and that requires a different skill set, a different mindset among the worker. We also see not just the augmentation of work, but the creation of new work, the transformation of work um, as well that is going to be the case with this advanced work automation. So I wanted to show just a, a few quotes of some executives that we've spoken with. And, and all we do as a research firm, if we're not collecting data, we're talking to CEOs, board members of companies, uh, heads of human resources from leading organizations around the world on a regular basis. And this is these are some of the insights that, that really speak to where we see things going. And it really gets to one of the points that Catherine made, which is around you know, the, 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 the data-based decision-making, the augmentation of data to really drive much better predictive uh, analytics and, uh, and, and scenarios that are much more rooted in data that companies need to capitalize on. And so Irene Chang Britt is a board member of three different public companies and she was talking about how that muscle really lacks in most organizations. Not all organizations are incapable, but she said across the board, you know, this is a, this is a muscle that needs to be strengthened. Uh, Wagner Denuso from Prudential, who's in charge of capability and their future of work initiative was talking with us just a couple of weeks ago about how when you think about transformation, the focus really is on one thing. It's on the capabilities you're trying to build, but which are the greatest ones that, or which ones have the greatest value to your stakeholders? And that takes a 
different, that, that hits upon a theme that we've been hearing from leading executives at leading organizations around, we cannot look at activity anymore. We've got to be looking and placing much more intelligent bets on the things that are gonna make the biggest difference at our firm. Well, that's where a lot of the machine learning and AI and advanced work automation is going to help these companies make sense of the mass amounts, the treasure troves of data that they have. And then lastly, I wanna show you what uh, Monica Poole Knox from Microsoft, she's the head of HR for multiple business units, including their AI platform mixed uh, uh, reality businesses. And I love how she talks about discoverability and this really pulls what we're talking about and showing where we're gonna take the ecosystem next, which is at Microsoft, she's talking about, we need to be able to enable all, all of our workers to be able to discover what's next for them within Microsoft. Think about the trapped value within organizations around the world. What we're talking about with trapped value is knowledge, experiences, interests, other skills that are, that are not part of someone's traditional job role. And as a result, they're not being tapped into as a business. And that discretionary uh, skills, capabilities, experience, that's either being uh, you know, uh, 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 applied elsewhere, maybe in volunteer assignments, or maybe a worker that's really uh, critical to a business is saying, you know what, I, I cannot find that opportunity here, or that's not uh, my, my job at my firm is not allowing me to take advantage of other interests I have and capabilities, I'm going to apply them elsewhere. And so what she's also talking about is the discoverability at Microsoft to discover the people within their firm of what they have, uh, those skills and experiences, but also allowing their people to find those next best opportunities. And you'll see in just a moment, and you'll hear in just a moment, how that's being uh, leveraged through advanced work automation. Now, this model right here is one that we put forth um, in that study we did uh, that we called the, the human and AI interface. And what we're looking at here is if you think about the maturity of different firms, whether they're discussing the and considering the use of advanced work automation, maybe they're experimenting right now, perhaps there's broad utilization of it, okay? Or maybe even further, what we've outlined here are certain steps that companies need to be pursuing. So I've highlighted a few just by uh, uh, the dashed marks here, but you'll see of identifying the future required skills. So companies like Cisco, the technology firm, are using data from burning glass, and they're, they're looking at what their competitors are um, putting out there for job postings out there on the web. They're looking at their own job postings. They're interviewing their managers. They're looking at the data that they've got versus the data where the market's at and we're and juxtaposing that against the business strategy going forward and saying, hmm, the skills that we have, the capabilities that we have versus what we anticipate we're going to need, how do we, what kind of gap is that? Um, and where does that present opportunity for us? Where does that allow us? That's the assessing of the capability piece. How can we start thinking about people in our firm that have transferable skills? or adjacency skills, whereas if we were to, you know, they're currently in a role that we don't view as being uh, relevant going forward, but we've got these new roles or these new work components that we're going to need as a firm that require similar type of skills, but need to be augmented a little bit. How can we prescribe now to them or have AI and other advanced work automation map the needs of the business to the skill set and capability of the individual and prescribe the right learning path for that individual, whether their experiences, whether their network connections because of the relational component, whether their uh, critical skills needed to advance and get to a certain level of certification. And all of this flows together. This is where strategic workforce planning, where upskilling and reskilling, where talent acquisition, all of this comes together. Uh, for a firm. Now, 
What we recommend, and this is really builds on the webinar from last week um, at SEEBS, is companies have got to be looking at their talent ecosystems much differently. We know that high performance organizations view talent through a different lens. They're looking at the definition of talent being much more broad than just contractors served up by a managed service provider that they've historically worked with, or perhaps uh, just full-time equivalents that they need to hire for. They're looking and saying, how do we use partnerships, maybe with startup firms like Unilever's doing with their foundry system, where if they don't have the capability internally, they can put out something to a, a swath of smaller startup firms where they can tap into that innovation and have collaborations that way, where they can use and leverage robots and AI to augment work or to bring in a level of capability um, or intelligence they don't, they don't have to augment the work in that regard, where they can partner with academia and saying, how can we create um, internships or co-ops um, or apprenticeships that really allow us to bring in the ready now talent that we need when we need it. I mean, there's all kinds of elements to this ecosystem. And that is where we see leading organizations. But the question that, that everyone on this call needs to ask themselves is, if you went up to a line leader or a business unit leader at your firm and said, hey, you know, how ready are you to look at these various pools of talent for what you need versus just me going out and finding a full-time equivalent or pulling from our, ma our managed service provider. How ready is your firm to take this on? And a lot of firms, they're not, but this is where the augmentation of work is going. This is where we see it. The last thing, Robert and Catherine, that I'd like to posit is this. We believe very, very much. This is true now, but it's gonna be more true. When you think about the importance of ESG, environmental social governance. When you think of stakeholder capitalism, look at where the World Economic Forum is at and where they're taking their International Business Council members. Look at what Larry Fink is putting out there from BlackRock and saying, hey, if, you're, if, if we're going to invest new capital in you, these are certain areas where you've got to be focused. The criticality of an organization's purpose, why you exist, beyond just profit, but people, profit, planet, the criticality of that purpose, how that is brought to life and supported by the organization's culture, both of those manifest into the reality of the perception of people, whether it's customers, whether it's other stakeholders, whether it's your employees, that's their reality of your firm, that's your brand, we believe very much that there is a new corporate currency that will dictate whether or not a company wins in the future because it has the capability it needs and the culture that will support that capability and not kill that capability. Thanks a lot. Um, is your sermon finished? How about that? Got a little evangelical on you, didn't I? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, I love the vehemence with both with that's why you're both on the call because you're coming in with the passion that you're bringing. You know, I was reflecting as both of you were speaking on my early days about studying economics and the theory of the firm. We're a long way from that original theory of the firm and where that's developed from from even Williamson and you know just a few years back. You mentioned these P's, you know, planet, purpose, profit, progress, process and I didn't intentionally say people because and that's a question that we came up. The organization, I wanna kind of focus it back on the, or the future of the organization or the organization of the future. Do we even need people? Maybe, maybe, and this is something that's come up in a few discussions, maybe firms are only brokers of tasks or brokers of specific the things that are, you know, maybe we don't have any employees anymore. Catherine's your video made it very, very to the point, you know, 3000 down to 20 or 30. And none of those 3000 were probably of the 30 or the 20. They had to take in new people to do those jobs. It, probably technical engineers that weren't in those warehouse jobs before. So when we think about the role of people. Do, do people have a place in the future of the organization? 
And what is that place? It's definitely, is, is, it, is it a leading place? It used to be that people is our main asset. Is that still going to be the case in 2030? Well, I, I'll start out. I'll, I'll start out and I'll let Catherine build on this, Robert. I, I think the corporate value equation clearly has shifted, right? In the last few decades, you've gone from more, you know, the assets and the, the value of a company being so much more tangible or tangible plant property equipment, et cetera. Uh, it is so much more intangible now, and that's inarguable, right? That's why the investment community is coming out and putting a lot of pressure on corporations to be much more uh, transparent in what they disclose around their effectiveness of their managing their culture, managing their capability, their people, et cetera. We don't see that that emphasis letting up at all. Um, the, the, it is it is very interesting when you start thinking about you know clearly you know uh, thinking about uh, the way work gets what work means and how it gets done within a firm now whether that person is a full time employee or whether that person whether a firm has you know, uh, you know, it's like the old Hollywood model, right? Where you've got a director, you've got a producer, you've got a few others, and then you're basically you've got you've got a bunch of gig type people that assemble together. They work on that project, they get it done all the way throughout, or maybe they come in for certain things they need, move out where their expertise is not needed, and they're on to that next assignment. Maybe that's where we're where things are going in that regard. I don't know the answer to it, but one thing I'm very, very confident with, because this is where we see leading organizations going, is they're looking at being the much more, quote unquote, fluid organization. And the skills, you know, where knowledge, skills, capability are seamlessly and borderlessly moved throughout the organization. And so I believe very much that we're going to see organizations take on that type of fluidity where it's much more like a chess match, you know, where, mm -hmm. where different pieces are moving around uh, the, the chessboard in a variety of maneuvers. And it's it's up to people, you know, I think about this, I think about what Tata Consulting has done in India with, you know, close to 400,000 workers, certainly the 300,000 uh, knowledge workers, where they built T factor models, right? Where it's deep in certain domain expertise, but much more broad across other areas, uh, adjacency areas that make them so much more pliable and, uh, and, and leverageable across the supply chain and across different projects. Catherine. Yes. Um... You know, following up on what Kevin has said, I totally agree. The organization of the future is going to be a lot more fluid. In terms about looking at the, the fluidity about organizations, a couple of things come to my mind. One is what kind of organizational structure are we going to have? You know, in the past, we're talking from very much, um, you know, functional structure to divisional to matrix to, you know, front end, back end structure. And now, now if we, are we going to be organized by projects? Are we going to be organized by events? Or are we going to be organized the fluidity, fluid organization? Actually, I would like to go back to the, 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 the little video, jd.com. Actually, their organization, they use bamboos as a symbol of how they organize. For bamboos, you know, the, when you look at bamboo above the, you know, the, the soil, earth, what we can see is each is shooting up. But the, their roots are all totally connected together um, invisibly. Mm -hmm. So they are organized right now by task. What is our strategic or important task or prioritized task today? Then we'll get that done. Mm -hmm. That's how they're going to organize. Mm -hmm. But the assumption I think before that is everyone needs to understand where we're moving forward than ever because the people at the front line, in the you know, middle and you know, the, in the top and the, everyone needs to understand what is our priority, what we try to do then you can gather, work it together, um, you know, breaking the, all the boundaries of organization to work on tasks. So, and also the 
Another aspect I may add is that the employee organization relationship may have changed forever. Just like you said, you get a few gigs, but these gigs may not want to work for just one organization. They are driven by interesting projects. They may be freelance uh, experts. So therefore, maybe the organization of the future is that you not only have the full-time employees, you have people you work with on a long-term collaborative basis, like partners. You also may have freelancer workers. And then also you may have contract workers. You don't really have deep engaging relationship with, which is very transactional. So the employee organization relationship may also change in the future. It's so interesting, you know, Robert, just to, just to comment and just to build on something Catherine said, you know, there are several organizations we've spoken with that have, you know, they've got a more fluid type of organization. They've got a, a, a more robust type of uh, talent ecosystem. And what's really interesting is start bringing up the culture component. Because to the point of, you know, if you start working with a lot of people who, you know, they're, they're just not ingrained within the culture of the business, they're not living in the culture of the business in that regard, what they have found is that, um, you know, the project teams that they'll put together, they will not, uh, for instance, if they have a project team of nine, five will need to be an FTE from the company. Right. Four, they don't want the balance of power to shift, right? Yeah, and yeah, because that's right. Problem. and. Yeah. It falls That's apart. Right. If it's only gig, it falls apart, right? That's it's, exactly it sounds right. Sounds good, but actually doing it may not work. Let, let me yep. shift gears a little bit. Let me shift gears a little bit. I don't want to go back to the systemic issues we have at the organization. There's so many topics under this. One of the things that was, was talked about was this capability uh, of uh, even society and shift, uh, shifting skills uh, requirements going forward. Catherine, you mentioned, you know, the, with the reorganization of implementing AI in firms, they're getting rid of whole middle management levels. So it's, you know, top management, a few people doing the organizing and most of the people doing the work. When we look at Google, for example, it's all around this up to seven person teams. So the question I have is around the shift in the skills needed. One, it still seems that firms are not able to see that far out really what they need and that there's a huge gap also into society for where we're going to get those skills you know we need people with with lots of different skills than we need today we know some of the skill sets but society is not able to deliver those in the speed with which we need them How, and so this talent ecosystem is is warped. It's you know it, it's distorted because the needs are so much different than what the what we're, what the deliverables are from the school, the secondary and tertiary system today, which takes much longer. So wouldn't it wouldn't it, my question is wouldn't it make sense to put much 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 more effort into changing that at the educational level? Yes, I would think so. Basically, when we look at the future of organization and the skills we need because we also talk about agility, mm. um, you know, fluid organization, mm. multifaceted um, skill sets, honestly, is really probably would contribute to organization the most. Where do people get that? Mm. Maybe through different roles they play in organizations, through a lot of coaching inside organizations, so experimental learning processes, that's what I can see. And mm -hmm. more and more, we probably not only, and also scenario-based classrooms. Mm -hmm. People can see, you know, you change scenarios constantly, and that is another way to develop people as well. Mm -hmm. So um, like in the Michelin case, what their middle level is doing, are doing, they are not let go. And they are all become coaches mm -hmm. of the frontline workers to, you know, help them to learn those basic managerial skills, mm -hmm. managerial accounting, quality management, work allocation, project management, and all, all, all that. Mm -hmm. So the learning happens on the job. Mm -hmm. And if we think about the educational system, so the learning should happen while we're doing something and not just, uh, you know, um, 
you know, we think case study is great for business schools, but nowadays, um, as Rob, you know, we try to do real situation learning. You, you know, you are on site, you, are, you, you, you see different scenarios, you learn right there. And you have a lot of different kind of um, information and you reflect together, you have a lot of processing going on. So there's a huge time, a gap here between the, let's say the uh, official education system and, and what firms are needing. You know, most firms, when I look at to, to, to the COVID shock overnight had to adapt to certain things and they didn't have an opportunity to go back to school and reskill and all, they just had to do it or they didn't. And so you see a lot of firms that were able to handle this agility and many firms that weren't able to handle it. And not because of uh, the industry that they were in. It had to do with what Kevin keeps referring to is the culture within the firm, right? Kevin, you, any thoughts from you about that? You know, I, I go back to what Satya Nadella at Microsoft, the CEO of Microsoft said, you know, and I, there's, a, there's a great interview that Ajay Banga, the CEO of Microsoft did of Satya back three years ago at the FinTech Ideas Fest. And literally, Satya, and it was as, as simple as could be stated, not that the issue is simple, but, you know, anytime that there's a, a new concept needed at a business that requires new capability, that, and, and that's fine. But the, the problem is, is that culture will oftentimes kill the capability. Listen, I, I, I think, you know, Robert, um, you know, one of the things that you brought up with Catherine, I think, really resonates strongly. We've, we've done a tremendous amount of uh, research uh, with in the United States with the Upskill America initiative. And this was an initiative that started under the Obama administration. And I cannot tell you how, how much of a, a need there is for much greater, you know, localized, and I could even see on a federal basis, but certainly localized partnership between government, academia, and business. And they're just, we're just not seeing it. And if I look at a country, and I, I, I think it's Sweden, it could be Denmark, it's one of the Nordics, they have, that's one of the things they've got down uh, so solidly mm -hmm. is that type of triumvirate, which you know, feeds into a ready now type of workforce. And I, I really believe that that area you brought up with Catherine is a critical one that, that should not be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got a bunch of questions coming in. I'm going to try and keep, if I can ask you both, just try and keep your questions a little, sh answers a little bit shorter. I know you are excited, but we've got like so many questions. I'm going to go through some of these uh, um, questions here. Chander, so I've made a list, by the way. Um, there are many, many people, experts in this space on the call. So this is, uh, this is really, uh, I'd love to have this be a, an open forum, but when we've got so many people, it's very difficult uh, to have everybody in the gallery just uh, having a conversation. So we're going to do this. So Chander, Chander Nagpal has got a question. It says, one argument being made is we need a different strategy, culture, leadership, and talent within the same organization. One of the existing core business models and another for new growth business models. So the, the run the firm and grow the firm. Thoughts on that for multi-culture? within the type of firm? Catherine? Uh, yes, I, I, I think so. And I also see another question that probably is related about hair. So, uh, hair, as we know, is a very large uh, white appliance producer in the world. And uh, they have a system called the meaning that they, they create the eco, small ecosystem for frontline employees to satisfy specific or new customer needs through creating a, you know, a innovative um, teams mm -hmm. to do that. It's like an ecosystem to incubating uh, businesses on hires platform. So you are running your main business as a wide goods producer. And then you got your distribution system and all that. On the other hand, and in, on the, at a different level, you have two people team, three people team, five people team to work on hires platform with her. And they, will, they are all hires employees. Is it entrepreneurship? 
Um, so that's the, the coexistence of different systems. One is a gigantic organization, another is very fluid entrepreneurial organization. When these small Rendang uh, Hei units grew bigger, they can serve customers outside of higher system, which needs a different strategy, different leadership and different capabilities right there. And let me just build real quickly, Robert. I, I'm not suggesting at all that there's only one culture in a company. That's ridiculous. Um, what we, yeah, I mean, it, it functions, departments, regions, business units, they can have a, their, all, all their own cultures and that's great. What I'm talking about is leading organizations know this. There are certain values and leadership behaviors that need to be consistent across the organization. This is what it means to be like, this is unacceptable or acceptable here. That's what I'm talking about is that consistency there where you're allowed to localize certain other areas uh, from a culture standpoint. Great, love that. I'm Here's a provocative question from, from Ulf. Fantastic discussion. People may not be needed in the future, but uh, the people may not be needed in the future, but so are organizations. The legitimacy of the firm is questioned. Firms are not needed to broker tasks even. Do you agree? So I was saying maybe firms are only the brokers of tasks. Ulf is saying maybe we don't even need firms to do this. Um, may I take a shot at it? Sure, please. I, yes, in some ways it's true already. For more than ever, um, people do not need organizations. Organizations need people. Uh, it, why is, because there are so many freelancers right here. We have uh, platforms in China I have seen that is really serving freelancers. In China, we have, I, I, I don't quote me on this. I'm not exactly remember the source of that. In China, we have probably more than 70,000, that's too big a number, 700,000 uh, self-employed people, freelancers, and that's growing. We have ecosystem, the platform to help people to get your license, you get a legal and tax and all. There are one person or two people, companies all over the place. Do we need a broker? No, you just like the, um, the LKK uh, design yeah. platform, they will issue a task. They say, okay, I've got a customer who needs to design a lighting fixture. Yeah. And then five designers, they say, let's give it a try. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. And we'll bring in the customers into the design. So, so, so yes, so Kevin, absolutely. Are, are firms even needed? Yeah, right. Uh, we're pushing the limits here, right? Um, that, oh. that, that boards today, boards that you know, Kevin, are talking about their future organization. Do we need even the employees to, to have a, it's not that far away to think, do we even need firms? <laughs> uh, it's pretty, I'm not sure how it's going to, how it's going to be managed, therefore, maybe through blockchain is the best way to do this. Um yeah, I'll ask you another question. This is uh, from my friend Chai Porn. Chai Porn is a professor of finance and, uh, at, uh, Kuala Lumpur, in Kuala Lumpur at uh, Sunway University. Chai Porn's question is, given that a skill set tends to be out of date in a short period of time these days, what or how could firms do to keep their human capital staying current and relevant? So the, the shelf life of skills gets shorter and shorter and shorter. How do we stay on top of this? Oh goodness gracious! I mean, that's that's that is what firms are trying to do right now. I mean, this is this is all about the, the first thing I would suggest is you know you've got to create a culture of continuous learning at your firm. Uh, you can build all the types of learning capabilities you want, and this is where we see so much energy and, uh, and effort going. But if you don't have leaders that exemplify and support and promote what learning is. And, and reinforce that people need to be constantly learning, it's gonna fall apart. And I would suggest, you know, you, you build that culture of continuous learning and Microsoft's a great example of that. I mean, that's, that they're, they're, the, they're, they're right out there and everyone knows what they're doing around it. Um, that is where really 
the, I, the, the, the muscle that companies have got to be building here is constantly understanding. It's the constant connection of where are we going? Where are the opportunities that we're going to be capitalizing on? What is that going to require of us? What do we have versus what are we going to need? And then providing the pathways. And this is where it's a, it's a three-way accountability. The organization has got to be able to map that out and provide the learning type of vehicles. The managers have got to support that and promote that and coach and, and encourage people, et cetera. The learners have got to be responsible. The onus falls on them to stay relevant in that game. It's, that's that three-way accountability. And so, uh, I mean, very, very easily said, a lot of firms are pers pursuing that. AI and machine learning are working well. Um, there are so many, if you think about like even just an internal talent marketplace, the platform providers to that, the AI that's, that's allowing people to, to pull in massive data from their LinkedIn profiles. This is data companies have had no ability. They, they don't understand all the capabilities and experiences their, their people have, but now they've got these inventories and they're saying, wow, okay, how does that map up against you know, these opportunities that we've got within our firm. And, you know, can we start pulling data from our learning management system to show us what are people accessing? What are people in the mo most successfully done that complete this task well or do this job well? What are they doing? How can we then push that out and get people on that path? This is where it all comes together. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to have a couple of polls here right at the end. But before, um, Susanne Miller Zantop asked a question, uh, what communication skills are needed at the top to keep together a fluid organization by communication? Sounds like an easy, easy question, kind of like a, 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 a given, but we see so many communicate. I think she's asking, she's a communication specialist because she sees time after time we fail with the communication. So what, what communication skills are needed to keep it, this fluid organization together from your experiences? I think uh, my two cents would be deep listening with empathy. And we, that's one. Another is we really need to communicate supportively so that People are willing to experiment, to discover, to explore, to try, and to learn. Thank you, Catherine. That's great. I would just build on it and say, in addition to what Catherine said, I would say always communicating the why. Clarity is so incredibly important. And uh, there is so much distraction, disturbance, uncertainty, the more clarity you can provide on why we're doing this, what's happening next, where are we going, what are we doing for you, all that needs to follow together. I'll tell you a little anecdote, and Susanna, this is for you on this. We had, uh, re last year, we had a very, very large state-owned enterprise from China come to Switzerland that we were doing training and, and showing them about differences of, of, of thinking and, and, and ways of doing things. And at the end of the week, the CEO, I had before, I didn't just um, surprise him. I told him I'm going to ask him the question so that he could prepare a little bit because he had his team with him. And I asked him, what's the main thing you've learned this week and that you're going to work on changing when you go back home? And he said, and we know why, listen better to my people. That's the single most important thing I can do as a leader is to not talk at and talk towards my people all the time. I don't actually have any of the answers, but to listen to them much, much more carefully. So, and he didn't say the empathy part, but I have to agree with you. It's, it's listening and taking it and, and, and yeah, inside, right? Great. Um, Kevin, you had a couple of polls you wanted to ask the, the audience. We've got a, a great group of people here asking fantastic questions. And, and as we're getting to the end of the, uh, of the session here, there's still a bunch of questions that we've got unanswered. And what we will do is we will capture those, send those to you, uh, Kevin, and to uh, Professor Shin, and ask you that you could um, provide a, just a short answer on some of those questions, we send those back out to everyone in the audience. 
um, because we can't get to, that says it's a great a great uh, uh, session because all the questions coming in. But uh, Kevin, I'd like to turn it back to you with some of the, the, um, the polling questions that we're gonna give you a poll. And so what I'd like you to do is when Kevin asks the question in the chat function, you can just type in your answer, okay? Sure, thanks Robert. So the, the, the first polling question, just curious to get people's uh, thoughts on this is, you know, which of the following, so just select just one, um, or you, you could select all of them, I guess. Oh, you could select all if you can, yeah, multiple choice. Which of the following has your organization prioritized regarding advanced work automation? So is it communications? Uh, you know, why, you know, how and why this is critical to the business? And is it upskilling, reskilling? Um, is it redeploying workers with transferable roles where you can augment things? Um, is it disaggregating traditional jobs into work components so that you could better figure out where that, you know, where that task, let's say, could fit into the ecosystem, or is it none of the above? Great. So I'm watching the polls coming in. Do you see these, Catherine and uh, and uh, Kevin? Do you see the poll? None of the above, 28%. Yeah. Yeah. Upskilling. That's it's it's interesting. That's that's where we see most organizations right now. They're looking at probably the upskilling piece in that regard. Um, I'm not surprised at all. This is so consistent with uh, data that we captured recently. Catherine, what do you anything stand out to you? Yeah, I, I think that's what I I see and agree. Yes. What what I see is when I've been working with the uh, cultural change in in my past and working with different organizations is don't talk about it too much. Don't go in and try and talk about culture for culture. Just go in and do the reskilling, the rebehaving, the re, you know, get the action changing, the culture follows. Don't too, yeah, you know what I mean? I am surprised though that 28% of the people polled said none of the above, right? So yeah. <laughs> that's another question, you know, that's a whole other, Discussion we can have, thank you. So let's go to poll two. Awesome, yeah, poll two, this is select just one. And so um, this is regarding the future of work at your organization, which of the following poses the greatest challenge or if you'd rather you know, look at it as an opportunity, right? Challenge is an opportunity. So when you think about the future of work, which poses the greatest challenge or, or opportunity? Go ahead. Actually, you know what? This is consistent uh, with Deloitte's uh, survey. Uh, the trend of organization in the future is issued this year, which is a number one for this on the survey. A strong identification with organizations very similar to this result. Hey, mm. Kevin, you got, you know, you think about the, you know, the cross, cross checking or the research validity. Look at the, the Deloitte survey, actually. Then the, the second item, it didn't surprise me. It, it goes just, back to culture and purpose again as well, right? Um, exactly. Culture Indeed. and purpose. What are we about? Who are we, who are we about? What do we stand for? Uh, and embracing you into the family. We, you know, even SEEPS, we talk very much about the family of SEEPS for students and for staff and for faculty. It's a... a the family is, 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 is the, the key word. It's not clan or school, it's family over and over and over. And I think that says a lot about that sense of inclusion or belonging in our, just as a case in point in our, in our institution. Well, we're over time. I think the participants, especially for your patients for going a few minutes over, I really like the questions, the, the smartness and the depth of the questions coming in. Thank you very much to, to you, Professor Shin, for taking your time and your evening away to be a part of this. And Kevin, to get up very extra early to be a part of this coming out of Boston. We will um, send the questions to you and to you participants, we'll go back out to you with the, uh, with the answers to some of these questions, as well as at least an excerpt of the slides that were um, sent to us from both Kevin and Professor Shin. So thank you all. I look forward to seeing you next week for our next uh, webinar. Catherine, Kevin, participants, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good afternoon, evening, and a day. Bye-bye.